Hello and welcome to another episode of the Film Nerd Podcast. This is episode 8. I'm Vince, and tonight I am joined by a special guest. I am joined actually by the original guest of the podcast, Mr. John Horford. John is a fellow Lansing native, also a fellow graduate of Grand Ledge High School. He played college basketball at University of Michigan as well as Florida. He appeared on a few NBA rosters and spent some time playing in the NBA's G League. Uh, John is now running his own business called Blueprint Athletes, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end. I'll have him plug it at the end. And uh, John is also a big movie guy, loves watching movies. John, how you doing, man? Welcome. Welcome back. Man, fantastic. Glad to be back. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a couple of years, it feels like. Has, yeah. Has uh, yeah. This point, right? It was August of 2018. Damn. Yeah, I think it was August five. 2018. Yeah, John was on... If you, if you go on YouTube, where uh, I've been posting these, and you scroll down to episode one and two, they appeared, I believe it was July and August of 2018 was when I did it. And then I just got too busy, and uh, I don't know, I, with quarantine and everything, being stuck at home all the time, just found a way to do it again. I'm like, I got to get John back out. We got we got to do this again, because we had a great time. I'm glad you're back after it, man. Well, John, first here, I, I, I'll ask you a couple questions here about yourself and your movie-going experience. I've been kind of... Uh, the last few episodes I've been back with each guest, kind of asked them about their movie going trends over the last year. Um, first, how you doing in general? How you handling things? How's life for for you and Christina on the home front? Uh, we're doing well, man. Fortunate and uh, being healthy these days is just like the the biggest blessing that we can ask for. So we're fortunate to be well and healthy and absolutely. A little, uh, a little stir crazy wanting to <laughs> get out and travel a little bit but it, it'll come with time yeah we were just talking before i started recording i know john and christina his wife christina are big big travelers and john working with athletes all the time how has that been going have you been able to work one-on-one -on -one at all have you been able to go up into the gym or even out i know it's starting to get sunny but yeah. not quite warm enough to be outside yet but yeah, I've been able to train my kids. Um, we've just been working in smaller groups. We're masks, take yep. temperatures, wash hands more often. Okay, so yeah, you have been doing a little bit of that. Yep. So and we haven't, fortunately, knock on wood, no, we've had no uh, no exposures or or anything like that. So have you been working up at the uh, at the high school too, or just more in private stuff? High school on the weekends, we go to the high school, and then during the week, we've been going to actually Oneida Gospel Church. Okay. So enough to, to let us use their gym, so we've been going there. So we go Monday, Thursday at Oneida, and then Saturday, Sunday. Um, we didn't go today, but we went yesterday at the high school, so five, six days a week. Nice. Well, that's good to hear that that's, uh, I know, obviously, the high school seasons have started back up again, but I was kind of curious on what the limitations were in terms of you know, people like you who are, you know, you're not necessarily coaching a team, but you're spending a lot of time working one-on-one -on -one with athletes. I was curious to know how that was going and what was allowed and what wasn't. So that's good to hear you guys have been able to do, um, uh, do, a, do a lot more of the things that you couldn't do for a while there. Um, kind of switch, switch. We can talk about basketball a little bit at the end here when I, I'll plug you at the end because we are going to talk about some movies here pretty quickly. But before we get into a couple of the movies that we're going to chat about tonight, um, how has your movie going experience been over the last year? So every guest here I've had on over the last couple of weeks, I've, you know, has not so much the most unique experience. Everyone's has been pretty similar, but how about for you and Christina? I know you guys have been watching a lot of documentaries, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. But, um, have you been to a movie theater yet? Uh, since shutdown since last nope. March, nope. Nope. not nope. been to one. Haven't been to one and really haven't watched too many movies, watched a lot of series, um, a lot of documentaries, uh, a few movies, but none are really sticking out too much. The last movie I actually watched was, have you ever seen Patterson? I have not. It's been on my watch list on Amazon Prime for since I think it came out with uh, Adam Driver, right? Yep. You guys yep. watched that run recently and enjoyed it? It was pretty good. It was just, it was different. Um, uh, I was talking to someone about it and he like said, this is a top three movie of all time for me. You need to watch it. He's like, it's a movie. He said he watches for comfort whenever he's feeling bad. He just, he enjoys watching this movie and it's a good movie, but I just, I had such high expectations. Yeah. yeah he built it up. The person who told me was just like, it's a top three all time movie. So I was expecting to just be like emotionally, like, like just 
swept away. Back and forth, just like, and I was just like, it's good, but From I'm what not. I've heard, what I've heard is a very simple movie. Very right, very uh, kind of grounded. It's just a day just in the life. Man's, it's, yeah, just a man's a life. Week in the life. Week yeah, in the life. a week okay. in yeah, a week in the life of a, a guy who's just like a bus driver and yeah, uh, just some average dude. Yeah, and he wants to be a poet, and you know, it's well, and I've, a, that director and the the guy's name escapes me. The writer director, I think he's kind of known. Um, Jim Jarmusch. I think it's Jim Jarmusch. 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 That Jim Jarmusch. Right. Um, I haven't seen a lot of his films, but from what I've heard, that's kind of his shtick. Very philosophical, but very grounded in, uh, in realism. And uh, some people might call them boring movies, you know, but they're they're more um, introspective and kind of heavy on their themes, not like hard-hitting drama or anything yeah. crazy. They're very simple, I've, from what I've heard. I, I'd, again, I'd have to look and see if I've actually seeing of his films but that's, that's the right. only film that in the last year really sticks out to you other than some documentaries maybe you've enjoyed that's the most recent film i've watched okay yeah that's the that most... wasn't a documentary yeah that wasn't a documentary um that was the most recent one outside of that nothing's really like coming to mind right now that was just like oh my gosh you gotta watch this you gotta see this but again i really don't watch that many movies <laughs> uh, I, unless I, I unless the you know couple times in two years that i've gotten to come on the podcast and i get you hey, to watch the movies <laughs> I, exactly exactly um so even though you haven't watched a lot of movies it says you said you've seen some tv shows and obviously some documentaries like we're going to talk about tonight in terms of the tv shows and documentaries have you found any go-to streaming services because obviously that's been you know the big thing over the last year with movie theaters shut down on and off and even though they're back open again you know most people don't want to go there's they're kind of keeping it safe um so what have been kind of your go-to streaming services uh off the top of your head or the ones that you're finding yourself gravitating towards most the one that i find myself gravitating towards most is hulu normally mm -hmm. we yeah have, that for tv shows for sure yeah we have like we have hulu we have netflix we have prime um, we have the HBO. I don't know if it's Max or Now or it's yeah, Netflix. they because they reconsolidated the Now and the Go because it was like HBO Now was like their standalone streaming service, and then HBO Go was for their HBO like TV subscribers got the HBO Go accounts, and so apparently yeah. they've reconsolidated now. It's just called HBO Max. Apparently, yeah, I just go. started an HBO <laughs> Max account. I I can't believe how much stuff they have. Oh, dude, they have a bunch of great stuff on there. Their catalog is incredible. I'm, I'm uh, kind of excited to explore some more stuff on there. Yeah, I was re-watching Deadwood, actually. and it just, I've never seen that show. i got to watch it. I like it. I really enjoy it. good things. I really enjoy it. And I, it's, it's, like an, it's basically like a classic Western, but, you know, modern HBO presentation, right? It's just, it's a, a Western, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, modern-ish. I think it was like early 2000s late 90s early 2000s yeah it was one of their early original shows around the time yeah. sopranos was out i thought it's a it's a good show and they find ways to like tie in a little bit of like some history kind of or like bring in historical figures mm -hmm. incorporate them into the yeah. town and stuff and it, that's what i've heard yeah no i enjoy it um yeah it's a good one well, all right, man. Um, other than that, I guess that kind of that kind of cuts it short there for questions. Um, any other comments you want to make on your movie going experience over the last year, or TV shows and documentaries, or just that's about it? Just been kind of kind of short on movies, big on shows, big on documentaries. <laughs> big on shows, big on docs. Christina loves like the murdery type true stuff. crime so stuff. We've watched so much true mm -hmm. crime stuff, like some really good stuff, some really like interesting history. Um, but I like to balance it out with like funny. So oh, like yeah. Bob's Burgers, Rick and Morty, uh, <laughs> Office, those types of shows. Actually, Modern Family too has been one that I've been watching a little bit more lately. I I've, to... I've never sat down to watch a show, but I've always heard good things about it. It's actually a really funny show. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I never really gave it much of a chance. I'm like ah, it's all right, but like I've sat down and we've been rewatching it from the beginning. It's actually hilarious. Like and like pretty well written. It's not too cheesy either. Because I hate I've, that. Yeah, I've heard good things about. I know, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not big on sitcoms. I I'm very picky when it comes to sitcoms. I. I like the stuff that's a little bit different. Like I'm big on like Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I took time in quarantine to finally 
finally commit to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and I loved that show. I had never seen it before. Watched the whole thing from start to finish, and I want to watch it again. It was so funny. Yeah, um, that, but that show, one. that show is like I love the tagline when that was originally coming out. They promoted it as Seinfeld on crack. <laughs> because because it's like Seinfeld in the sense that they're all despicable, unlikable characters, and that's the point. And but like they're also poverty stricken, you know, running a bar, kind of scumbag, you know, and it's like hard R television compared to Seinfeld, you know. So it, it takes like a far darker turn uh than Seinfeld does. So I love that 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 how it, that's how it's described, but yeah. Um, and I finally watched Parks and Rec. I'd never seen Parks and Rec. I watched that last year. Like it? And I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, oh. I think because uh, people always ask, you know, what do you like more, The Office or Parks and Rec? Because you know, same creators came. You know, they kind of overlap and uh, same network and everything. Very similar style um, presentation as well. I think The Office's early seasons, like their funniest stuff, like seasons three, two, three, and four, are better than anything on parks and rec but i think the overall show start to finish is way better parks and rec, parks and rec is really yeah because the office falls apart the office for me falls apart yeah when michael it, when michael leaves it tanks quick so much andy as the manager it's just it's bad yeah they they you could tell the writers were flailing trying to find something to hold on to to keep the show going why did they try to make him the star like because ugh. they they didn't i think what happened is you you've seen the show many times. You you're yeah, I mean, well aware. They tried to bring in, they tried to bring in new people, and it just doesn't work. They bring in Robert California. They bring in um, who's the um? They brought in Will Ferrell. Um, yes, Jim Carrey I, comes I, in an episode. I thought Will Ferrell. Or I thought uh, Robert California was actually pretty funny. Yeah, but that's when the show gets so bizarre, because James Spader's character is so even more bizarre than Dwight up to that point. Like Dwight is the most Dwight and Michael are the most like hyperbolic in terms of how they're written, like most unrealistic characters. Like if you're trying to keep the show somewhat grounded, like my, my mom loved that show when it first came out because she works in an office. So she's like, I can see all of these people as this person in my office. Even she goes, even Michael Scott and Dwight, there's people that are similar to that. Maybe not quite to that level, but then James Spader comes in. He's so bizarre. It like really yeah. takes the show to a whole new level of weirdness. Like the episode at his house in his mansion, the party. I, I know this is way I off topic that. from what we're going to talk I about. Love, but... I love that. I love that about it. Like, Do you? I'll, I'll take that over anything Andy does ever. Period. Yeah. Andy's not the interesting of a character. Like I, I can appreciate that they try to give his character an arc because he comes in as kind of this unlikable, um, you know, schmoozer and, you know, butt kisser. And then he goes to anger management and then he kind of comes back and turns himself around a bit. But I don't know. He just becomes boring by the end. I feel like he's not very interesting. Yeah, he's really not. And Pam, I like love Pam in like the early seasons. And then I grow to hate Pam. I hate what the writers do with Jim and Pam later in that show. It's so forced. The it's like tough. the conflicts in their marriage was yeah. just to create drama in the plot because there was nothing going on on that show of interest. It's the ending of that show frustrates me the last few seasons. But yeah. anyway, uh, that's that's way off topic for what we're gonna chat about tonight. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, buckle so up. what's that? The buckle up. <laughs> buckle up. All right. So let's get into the uh, the uh, main conversation here for the evening, uh, John. When I reached out to him about doing an episode, he suggested a documentary that has been praised and hailed and recommended for years by Quentin Tarantino. Um, and then so I recommended two more documentaries that, you know, kind of fit the mold of being weird, maybe not as well known. Uh, but the two I recommended were a little bit more recent. So we're going to chat about three documentaries. So we're going to chat about them in order uh, of release date. And the first one we'll talk about here is John's Recommendation. So I'll go ahead and introduce the movie. So the movie that we're going to talk about here first is the 1997 documentary called Hands on a Hard Body, the documentary, directed by a guy named S.R. Bindler. Um, and I went into his – the guy doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. I went onto his IMDb. He has not done much at all since. He's done very little um, in the 24 years since this film, 23 and a half years since this came out. 
Um, if you've never heard of this film, don't worry until John sent me a clip of a guy talking about it on TikTok. Uh, because of Quentin Tarantino. I hadn't heard of it either. I wasn't even aware that Quentin Tarantino had been recommending this. Um, so what is this documentary about? <laughs> so this documentary takes place, I believe it's in 1990. The documentary was released in 1997, 1995. So even though it came out in 1997, it's about a competition in Longview, Texas in 1995 um, at a car dealership. Uh, and essentially it's a year, it's an annual competition at this car dealership in this small Texas town where they use the radio. They have radio, uh, uh, they, they put this contest out over the radio for people, um, to put their name in and be selected at random. Um, and if they're selected, the competition, the competition, uh, involves people putting their hand on a hard body, hard body truck for as long as they can. Now, there's some stipulations. So basically whoever can hold, put their hand on the truck the longest without leaning on it, without squatting, without having their hand off of it, except for the breaks, they get five minute breaks every hour, 15 minute breaks every six hours. So whoever can do that. And again, those few breaks obviously don't allow for sleep. Don't allow to eat a whole lot. Don't allow for much of anything. It's really just to kind of sit down, eat something quick and then get right back to it. So even though this sounds like it may be a very boring concept, I mean, you read the synopsis or you hear me talk, you know, intro this film, you're like, that sounds really stupid. You got to understand what happens to people when they don't sleep for hours and hours on end. But then at the same, so that's one element of this that gets interesting. John's laughing already because we're about to talk about this. But the other thing that I think is very well done about this documentary is how the director and whoever, I don't know if he edited himself or whoever he hired to edit it. They have interviews with all of the participants ahead of time. So before they ever even have this competition, they interview everyone who's selected. And what they do is they juxtapose the interviews later on when the contestants are struggling. Their overconfident interviews are juxtaposed with their struggling during the competition. So they'll have, you know, some guy or, you know, girl, you know, they have a whole variety of people from all walks of life who come into this contest and, you know, some individual, you know, oh yeah, I, I got the mental fortitude for this. I'm going to last forever. And then they show them like almost in tears later on. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I, I can't, I'm so tired. Um, so that aspect of it, how it's edited together is very well done. So that was a little bit of an intro to it there. Um, John, what did you think about this documentary? You recommended it. You wanted to watch it. Uh, what were your thoughts on it? What would you think? Hey, actually, I really enjoyed it. Um, the guy, I can't remember the names, and I should have done more research before we had this. Uh, but the guy who had won the year before, I loved him. Yep. No, he won two years before. So I thought when two years before they said this was like the before. third year of it, I believe, and he won the first year. I gotcha. think. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, he, his whole like approach to everything and his demeanor, I thought was like so just chill, and he he approached it in just a realistic with a lot of humility, versus like, oh, I'm gonna kill this. I've done it before. Like he had he had a lot of respect. Yes. For the whole process of everything yes and he was also willing to like he wasn't like so competitive like he was helping people the whole time like um like giving people tips on like how to make it through like i, I thought that was just like awesome like um, oh absolutely yeah yeah you know, so i was looking i because i am curious i was trying to look it up here because i i also couldn't remember um the guy's name it was Oh shoot! Here's the list. Uh, not Greg, not JC. What the heck was the guy's? Brent? No, Greg. I'm trying to find the guy's name here. Cause what was that guy's name? He was one of the most interesting contestants. Was the guy who had won it the first year. Yeah. Um, geez, I know if I, as soon as I see it, was it Tom? No. I think so I, I don't remember it, but I just remember really enjoying. Um, his whole approach to everything. And then the the woman that was ultra religious was also extremely entertaining. Um, she was between her and the guy who had won it the first year. Um, and then the other guy who didn't last very long, but the guy who was also really overconfident and was eating snicker bars and oranges oh, for yeah. his diet also was cracking me up. Um, and then I think it was his dad came in later or his uncle or something was like, 
what like basically scolded him off camera's like that's not that's not good food he's not gonna last too much sugar or whatever he said yeah um but the other thing that i thought was really interesting about this film this documentary um was how the human condition kind of ends up getting explored over time um because if you think about it on the surface level, it sounds like a very kind of, eh, whatever documentary. But as you start watching it, you realize you got 24 strangers who are all like, they've never met before, but they go through this bizarre experience Ex together. You know what I mean? Where they're stuck together doing this very difficult, grueling task, you know, physically, mentally, this difficult task. And by the end, they've, they're have they like completely changed. It's like a life-changing experience that they've gone to gone through together. Um, and during this process, these people like kind of discover that you can make friends with the most unlikely people, especially when you go through something like this together. And by the end, they're crying, you know, when people um, end up losing. Um, they end up having to back out. They start crying. Um, it's fascinating. Um, when they really start getting stretched and strained to their max, you know, to their limits, um, a lot of the the participants um, have these very strong emotional responses um, upon elimination, and a couple of them, even when you're inter when they're being interviewed after they've failed the contest, um, they kind of, a few of them kind of touch on the fact that they met as strangers. None of them, ever, you know, none of them knew each other ever. And they come together, they go through this grueling mental and f mentally exhausting, physically exhausting, super bizarre experience together. And they all are, you know, within inches of each other, feet of each other for hours and hours and hours. So by the end, they're like friends and they know each other and they've gone through this experience together. So I think it's and they, you know, they they get into it in some of the interviews. It's this interesting thought on how we walk through life, you know, with people around us all the time that we never think to stop and talk to or meet um until you go through something like this with a stranger and then all of a sudden you're friends you know they're going to yeah. talk they're going to remember the experience forever i mean there's a moment in the documentary where the people two people the the winner and runner-up from the year before are being interviewed off or uh, on camera away from the the competition and it seems like they're still in communication they're still friends so it's like they go through this experience together and it's like by the end they feel bonded um, which I think is an interesting, interesting thing to think about. It really is. And there was even a guy who came back to cheer on Yes, uh, one of the people that he was standing next to. And she ended up being like the fourth person, like the, the she's one of the finalists. Person. Yeah. Yeah. She was like one of the finalists. And like when she lost, like they were like hugging and like embracing each other. And like crying, they yeah. were like lifelong friends, like, and yeah. they had only known each other through this competition. It's like wild. He was like cheering her on and she like literally just went into his arms after she lost. And like you said, they're like crying. And it's just like, it's incredible that you can have that type of uh, transformative experience that brings people together just through like what most people would think. What I even thought it's like, this is just a dumbass, like, hands on hard body competition yeah but... <laughs> no it, it and it does because if i you know as i intro this movie here to start or if you just went online and read the premise you're like why does quentin tarantino you know who's this big famous filmmaker why does he talk about this documentary um and again it, it has to do with what the transformation like watching these people complete they're like they completely break down by the end of this um because they're by the end the last few people remain have been up for what is it by the end? 80 hours. It's like more than 80 hours straight. I thought it was more than 90 because the one guy was going, he was going to try to get the, the one guy wanted to he get wanted to set uh, the, the record, the world record, which was like a hundred and like hundred and some. It was like hundred three hours crazy. or something like just stupid. Yeah. And uh, he ended up having to quit because he said his feet were getting numb and he was getting like some shooting pain into his legs. But he was, even when he like lost, like other people were like breaking down, he was like so stoic, even in, his loss 
Like I, I I'm just like, I want to have a conversation with this guy in real life. Like he just, he has a, and a, you're, you're talking about the guy who won it the first year. Yeah, exactly. It was Benny. Like, I found his name. It was Benny. Benny, yeah, Benny I, Perkins. I a mental fortitude, man. Yeah. And it was funny. Cause he was like, like, are you worried about anybody? He was like, the only person I'd really be worried about is if they had like a Marine, you know, so there was, was, and there was a Marine um, and he, he didn't make it long. No. Well, I mean, we say not long. It was probably like 40. It was 50, like 40 something hours. Yeah. Dude, which is like crazy. If you think about it, like two days with no sleep and you're dude, just standing imagine, by a car. I can't imagine standing in my own house and doing that. Just like touching my table, like my dining room table. Like, and they were out in the hot. That was the other thing. This was in the in summer. Texas. Yes. In Texas. So that's another thing. Um, if you're listening, you haven't seen the documentary. Um, they're outside in a parking lot. And they have a tent covering them. So, like, if it were to rain, um, or at least they're in the shade if there's sun. But it's still a 100 and something degrees out. So, these people are sweating. Um, by the end of it, they look like they stink, I'm sure, because they haven't showered in three or four days exactly. by, the, by the people who make it to the end. It's funny. And then uh, for, like, the final three contestants, I think they drug tested them. You remember that? To make yes. sure that they weren't taking any stimulants? Yep. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating too. I I thought that was very. Uh, I think that's a smart rule to have at the end because, what if, what if someone, what if you keep the competition going and the person who wins, I guess it would just be the runner up if the winner cheated. Um, but then I, I think they assume at that point, okay, maybe we can end this now if one of, or get it closer if one of you's been cheating and yeah. sneaking like caffeine or some sort of a stimulant, cocaine. doing some sort of a drug, <laughs> cocaine or meth or so, who knows anything oh, that would meth. keep that would them be- going up and longer and longer. Yeah, um, and Benny, remember by the end he could hardly walk. Dude, he was um, looking hard, and he had like his wife there. She was massaging him like during every several day. contestants in between had people there to massage their legs yeah. and their feet. Um, yeah, I I thought it was. Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning that I think obviously the subject matter by itself is very, you know, surface level. It doesn't sound that interesting, but as you get into it, the subject matter is fascinating, especially when they start to lose their minds. Um, but the presentation of the documentary, the overall, the, the structure of it and how it's edited together, um, because as I mentioned, this, the director and the guys that he worked with, they interviewed every participant before the competition and after, and most of the, the interviews before they splice in, they sprinkle in throughout. And like I said, they'll juxtapose this overconfident pre-competition attitude from the participants with them like dying later on, like they're in near in tears, they're exhausted, they can't handle it. And like literally things they say will contradict, you know, things they said in the pre-competition interview contradict what they're saying later on during the contest. So that like makes it a very interesting and even a fast paced watch. And obviously the documentary, I I don't even, it's not even two hours. I think it's like an hour 45. Um, So it's not like you're literally watching you know, sitting there in real time watching this happen. They skip ahead quite a bit. They wait until, um, you know, something interesting is happening in terms of the psyche of the people, um, you know, individual moments between the participants, between their families and friends, when they, when some of them um, decide to end it. Like the one, <laughs> the one woman, her and her husband with all their teeth missing, Oh, um, my gosh, yeah. and she like throws a huge fit about everyone cheating. And then there's a whole moment in the documentary where they start like kind of exploring, are some of these people cheating? Are they taking hands off? And, and the uh, judges aren't paying close attention. And there is a legitimate, you kind of notice that one girl, who, the younger woman who lasts a long time, they kind of, the camera kind of follows her and it does look like she takes her hands off both of them quickly. Um, and she ends up getting disqualified later for it actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like the religious, sad. the religious woman at the end gets disqualified because she's not. She's so delirious, in like religious exuberance. She's like clapping for God, and she just isn't thinking. And takes both yeah, her hands that, off the vehicle. Yes, the, the one girl I'm thinking of. Another one of them. You remember the one that just like wandered towards that? She started walking away, and they the were young. Like, yeah, that was the younger girl who, was who they her? thought was cheating. Yeah, she just. She just wanders off. She was She's like, like delirious. Like she walked off and they're like, they're like, she doesn't even live in that direction. And like her car's not over there. Like, and she just like started just like going. They, they say <laughs> to this day that she's still walking. <laughs> Dude, exactly. Like you just, people start losing their minds um, when they're talking about how like people just start like, uh, 
laughing uncontrollably. Yeah. And then Benny's like, you know, he's like, and I just joined in because he was like, it kind of just keeps you going a little bit. And they're just, well, all just looking at each other, just laughing. Well, like, and that, that gets into another interesting, you know, kind of conversation again with the human condition is these people are all pitted against each other, right? They're technically supposed to be competing against each other. But moments like that, like these moments of encouragement are what make it such a uniquely bizarre and fascinating competition because it's like even though they're pitted against each other they end up helping each other in a way be through conversation through making friendships through laughing together they end up kind of helping bring each other along at least the ones that last for a long time um without intending it and even one of the documentarians he interviews one of them he's benny i think it was benny and he's like what do you think about the fact that you guys are kind of uh helping each other he goes, what do you think about the fact that if you weren't m making conversation, that you weren't talking to each other, like that m more people would be out, out by now? He's like, yeah. He goes, you know, that's true. But, you know, w I mean, what are you going to do? Just sit here and stare into the abyss, you know, because <laughs> it's like you can't just do nothing. You Dude. lose your mind. Exactly. The guy who won, actually, I mean, if you when you watch it, Benny teaches him how to win. Yes. Like, and he's the guy who wins it is right next to him. And during the breaks, he's doing the same things. Like when Benny's squatting down and doing his little thing, he's doing that. When he stands up and he starts like leaning and rest, like he's copying him. And he's buddies. like, yeah, he basically just told me how to win. Yeah. Like, even though they were competing against each other, he gave him like the blueprint that he needed to survive the competition and like, you know, how to stay sane and, oh, yeah. and win it. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, it's very interesting. I, and it is also, it's something that I, I wonder, <laughs> um, I, I was going to do some research. And I didn't get a chance. I wanted to know if this is still something that's going on. If it's a competition that's for more than two decades, if they've still maintained it or not. Um, because it's not something I'd ever heard about. I have a feeling that it's not. I feel like it's detrimental to people's health. I mean, yeah, like but they're willing participants and you win a free truck. Oh, I guess I never said, I just realized, I don't think in the intro when I was introducing this, I ever said the goal. <laughs> I don't think I ever even mentioned the goal of the competition. So you, you win the truck. Um, I think I forgot to say that. So the, the person who lasts to the end, it's a brand new hard body truck. Whoever has their hand on the longest wins it. Um, and yeah, I'll be, I'd be curious to know. I got, I haven't had a chance to look it up if this is a competition that they're still having or not, but um, yeah, I don't know, man. It, it is just. It was some, and for me, um, I'm not big on documentaries, um, because a lot of times I find if I watch a documentary, I'm like, oh, that was interesting, but I don't know if I'd ever watch it again. But this was one I'm like, I think I'd watch this again. It'd be fun to watch it with people who've never like introduced to someone who's never seen it before. Um, just kind of like an experience to watch it together. Cause it is, it's very fast paced. It's, it's funny. Um, it's engaging, it's entertaining, and it does have some interesting conversation around it in terms of, you know, <laughs> just the the idea of people staying awake on end in one spot, standing up for 80 hours. It's just, it creates this so, this bizarre, these bizarre symptoms of people losing their minds and what they do to try and, and keep going. But it's just a, a competition of the mind. Um, cause you're the, they talk about it as well. Some with the, some of the interviewees, some of the participants, um, physically, most of those people, especially the younger people physically, they definitely could have kept going. They were tired, but it was their mind. It's your mind that breaks first because you're so bored. You're so tired. You're so hot. So your mind breaks down first because it keeps telling, I can't do this. I can't do this. You know, it's, it's like that Marine, you know, he was talking about all the things he went through. That's why I was surprised he didn't last longer because what they, you know, the physical exhaustion that they put and mental exhaustion, they put Marines through. Um, yeah, I thought he, he would last longer. He said something about how he had stayed up like a long time or something. I swear mm -hmm. it was it him who said that or was it someone else? I thought it was the lady with no teeth who said she had been up he, for yeah, she three also, or four days at one time and yeah, her husband no, had to. But before the competition, like they couldn't one of them couldn't sleep i don't remember which one it was i think it was, was the guy couldn't... who ate all the snickers bars oh was it him i thought it was him who said he couldn't sleep the night before he was too excited he goes i'm too excited i can't sleep so he had been oh, up for like mind. he had already been up for like a full day or something 
Mad oh, Billy. and no, I know who you're talking about. One of the younger guys, there was some guy who was really young, like in his 20s, yeah. who said that to prep for it, he didn't sleep. Like, he got one night of sleep because this was on a Monday, right? I think it was a Monday was mm-hmm. when the competition started. And I thought he said he slept the night before. But, like, the two previous nights, he had stayed awake for, like, two days. And he think he said it screwed him because it caught up to him. <laughs> Dude, yeah. He was, like, I trying thought. to find a way to prep for the competition. I'm like, yeah, you should've probably should have got as much sleep as possible. Time. What's that? He should have done it a couple weeks ahead of time just so, like, if you wanted to test, like, how long you could stay up, do it, like, two weeks ahead of time. I think it was a quick turnaround, though, wasn't it? Didn't they, like, enter the comp- – didn't they enter to be drawn, to have their names drawn, like, a week prior? And they, it was like, then they got called like Friday. It was like Thursday or Friday before the competition started. I thought they, they said it was like a really quick turnaround. I don't remember that part, but even if you knew that you were going to participate or potentially be selected to participate, you could start prepping. I mean, it's not like they just decided like on the drop, like, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm going to enter this competition. It's like, they probably knew that they were going to enter this competition. It was the third year that they've been doing it, you know? Yeah, that's true. I don't, I yeah, I, I don't even know, though, would – I don't know if that would prep you for it, though, staying up. Well, I don't know. Just, to, just to test how long you set. And it doesn't – I don't think it does prep you because then, I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand outside? Like, That's what I'm saying. In the car yeah. <laughs> for, like, as long as you can. But if you're by yourself, I feel like when you're – like, again, like I mentioned earlier, and they kind of talk about the documentary, when you're with a whole group of people like that – you kind it's like this natural competition builds like adrenaline and like this need, this desire to win. Um, but at the same time, they were also like supporting and encouraging each other. So I feel like without that camaraderie, without those other people, how would you test that alone, you know, by yourself? I think it makes it even better to test it alone because it's harder when you're alone. That's so true. It'll be easier. That when is you're true. People and you can, you know, buy or feed off their energy a little bit, but, um, yeah, uh, of the three, I would say I, I would rewatch that one. The other two, I, I don't, I, I don't think I could rewatch. Well, before we move on, uh, so um, if you want to watch this documentary, so again, it's called "Hands on a Hard Body." The documentary is the like the subtitle. Um, came out in 1997. Uh, you can buy it um on amazon uh they don't they didn't offer it to rent or maybe they did i can't remember they, didn't, they offered it for purchase only yeah. um i went to their website so there's hands on a hard body like dot com or something if you just search it on google you can rent it directly through their website for like 4.99 um it's like a two or three day rental so if you're interested in checking it out uh check it out apparently they made a musical <laughs> of this i don't know if you saw that john uh yeah you wait I, I think I did. I think in I did. 2012? Uh, yes, 2012. Yeah. Right, in 2012, right. um, the documentary was adapted into a musical called Hands on a Hard Body in California. Um, and someone wrote music and a play and lyrics and everything and created a musical adaptation on Broadway called Hands on a Hard Body. It was nominated for three Tony Awards in 2013. Um, I... <laughs> Haven't seen it. I uh, don't know if I'll ever check that out, but uh, yeah, something else you can check out with it. Apparently, um, at one point, there was a rumor that they were going to try and make a feature film uh, adaptation of the documentary, turn it into like a fictionalized version of it. Don't know if that's still going to happen, but th- that was on the IMDb page on the Wikipedia. That was like a little trivia fact. So, And again, Quentin Tarantino apparently talks, if you go on YouTube, he talk, he's talked about it many, many times before. So... Anyway, John, you have anything else you want to add about this? Otherwise, we'll move on to our next one here. Okay, keep things moving along. I think most of the points with that. I think it's time to to dive into the to the next one. Oh man, okay, the next one is going to get real weird. Uh, so the next documentary we're going to talk about here. So we're going to talk about three. So the second one is called Tickled. Uh, it is a 2016 New Zealand documentary about competitive endurance tickling and videos featuring it. Um. It was directed by a New Zealand reporter named David Ferrier and his friend Dylan Reeve. Um, and so the documentary starts off with the, with David Ferrier basically stumbling upon a Facebook page of competitive endurance tickling. And he finds some videos and a whole like fo- worldwide following about this underground world of tickling. And immediately 
he starts blogging about it, trying to create a documentary about it, and it turns really dark, really sinister, really fast. He gets hit with legal and ethical uh, issues um, in terms of cease and desist letters. These lawyers from New York get sent down to New Zealand uh, to try to come after him. It just takes a real dark turn uh, real quick. Uh, so th- the reason I recommended this one, John recommended Hands on Hard Body. And because it had such a bizarre premise, I was like, okay, there's a couple other bizarre documentaries, recent ones that I've been wanting to see. Uh, so I'll recommend those. <laughs> so I recommended this one because uh, I've heard heard it and I wanted to see it. John, what'd you think of Tickled? Um, it, like you said, it, it just turns really dark, really fast. Like when it starts out, you think that these are just like endurance tickling competitions and you notice that it's all men and it seems pretty sexual because they're like straddling them and holding them down and they're um they're like it's like bondage they're tied to the beds and they're tickling them with fingers and objects and um it's just like how long can you last and it's, it's like so uncomfortable to watch like, some it, of those videos it, is, it's uncom- it, it really makes is uncomfortable. me like like because yeah. i feel like i'm being tickled like i can't <laughs> and, and then it takes like dark turn when you find out that it's like tickle porn essentially basically they're they're recording it and they're selling it to people it's a fetish yeah it's a fetish and i mean and and the guy who's behind it all is so yeah so that's that's the most it it's not even the tickling that that's that interesting because the tickling is just weird what makes this documentary because you you don't even know what this documentary is about when it gets going you think okay it's about competitive tickling but then again it takes this wild turn so what John was just mentioning there is this, you don't even know it's a guy at first. This David Ferrier gets contacted by this company called Jane O'Brien Media. And he thinks it's this woman who's in charge of this entire operation, this very wealthy organization that runs and pays for all of this. And immediately he's getting like threats from this Jane O'Brien, um, homophobic slurs thrown at him. Um, so David Ferrier's bisexual and he gets called like the F word and, and these nasty things about homosexuality. Like it, it turns really nasty really quick. And David Ferrier even mentions, he goes, it was hard to take any of these insults seriously because it all seems so gay. (laughs) It's one of the funniest (laughs) lines in the movie. He's like, he goes, even though I'm, you know, bisexual, and he goes, and they're saying these nasty things to me, he goes, I can't really take the insult seriously because what they're defending is inherently, like, gay. So it was a funny moment, um, but then, obviously, David Ferrier can't let it go. He goes, he goes, I decided, you know, with all these attacks and legal threats, you know, it was kind of scary, but he goes, it made me think, you know what, I got to go deeper, I got to dig deeper. So what happens, obviously, is those three lawyers get sent first, um, and he meets with them and it gets hostile real fast. I mean, that scene, there's a scene in the airport when they first get there where David's just trying to be, you know, hospitable and nice. And, uh, they see him filming them. And the one guy like basically immediately switches, uh, you know, in terms of his, his attitude, like he goes from being friendly to like super nasty. Um, and David's explained while well, in New Zealand, we're allowed to film in public places, you know, it's not illegal. And, uh, they basically turn on him real fast. And as soon as they leave him and his buddy follow them to LA (laughs) and they go, you know what? We're going to dig deeper and see what's going on. So they follow these people into LA and as they start to dig deeper and dig deeper, what they ended up finding is this Jane O'Brien isn't a woman. It's this guy named David D'Amato who apparently had been in prison years before he had started he had started this online tickling thing back in the 90s, like in the early heyday of the internet, when the internet was kind of like the wild, wild west. Um, and he ended up getting in trouble uh, for all this illegal stuff that he did back then, and he went to prison. And then when he was released, um, what you find out later on is he is like, this guy is the recipient of millions and millions of dollars from his parents. His like dead mom and dead dad, when they passed away, like, left him all this money. So he's just like sitting in this place of power in New York, like pulling strings from behind the scenes, spending millions and millions to like feed his own fetish. And anytime someone tries to threaten it, he threatens them with legal, you know, 
legal uh, uh, repercussions because he has millions and millions of dollars to do it. I, I guess that's the other part that we have to say real quick is just that um, unless you said it and I just missed it somehow, the, they paid like he paid the people that were doing the tickling well. Like they weren't just very well it for free. Like they were getting paid and paid well. And the whole point was he was trying to make these people dependent on him. So he had complete control over them. Like he wanted them to like stop working and to essentially, I mean, pimp them out in, in a way. Yeah. I mean, because there's a weird moment early in the documentary when they finally get to LA um, cause they, they say that they're like reaching out to a lot of the participants trying to get them to talk about their experiences and none of them will meet with them. And they finally get this guy, I think his name was TJ or JT, something like that, who like was at one point, like a stud football player, like trying to break into professional football and he was desperate for money. And he did one of these videos cause they get paid. It was like $2,000 cash on top of being put up in a nice hotel. If they don't live in LA getting flown to for free, for like I mean, everything's paid for. Yeah, for like just this, you know, I think it was per video. It was like a per DM thing. Every time you did a video, you got money. And um, basically what happened is when they would post these videos online, they would use these pe- these guys' names. And so if someone like an employer did a, a search check or background check on these people, these videos would pop up of them in these super bizarre fetish tickling videos. And so this TJ guy, I think that was his name, mentions um, – that it was on YouTube. So he went to YouTube and tried to get the video copyright strike and said, hey, they're using my likeness and my name without my permission. And then a whole whirlwind of hell just rains down on him. The Jane O'Brien media starts sending him nasty emails, sets up a website with all of his, like basically doxing him, um, all of his personal information on this website and like telling his employers that he's gay, that he does drugs, that he's a pedophile, that he's done all these nasty things. Um, and, and like going after him. And so they basically like, and they don't know who this Jane O'Brien is. So these people are helpless. Um, so they basically have like gas, gaslight all these people into thinking, you know, there's nothing I can do. I'm just stuck with this. You know, I'm screwed. My life is, you know, I'm, this is, this is what I am now. Um, and you, again, you find out at the end, that's this, this wealthy creeper in this, like uh, lives in this private, apartment in new york somewhere controlling this from all he's got all these people on his payroll and even those guys that that david farrier the director of the documentary talks to in new zealand they said they don't even know who jane o'brien is like he's like created these like these like security blankets or like these these like walls in between himself and those who work for him so they have no idea who he really is exactly he has so many aliases it was interesting to see that one of the biggest tickling rings in the world is in Muskegon, it was Michigan. was in Michigan. Um, and it was just like he got a bunch of like guys who were like former wrestlers or just like down and out kids in Muskegon um, from areas where they didn't have a lot of money. And they're throwing thousands at them for doing yeah, this tickling basically stuff. basically preying on these young exactly. men. Exactly. But the guy there specifically was like, yeah, he really wanted us to not have a job, to focus on this, to do this more often to really try to make the people dependent. And the other thing that he was doing that they first mentioned there was getting the underage kids to do it. So essentially it's oh, child yeah. pornography. Yep. And so they were doing child pornography because they were selling it to people who were fetishizing it. And yep. like, I mean, and the dude, they know who he is. Like they, it's, I know it's so it, weird. Cause like John and I were texting, well, and you and I were texting when we were watching this and John's like, how the hell is this guy? How did he, excuse me how did he not get in trouble like how did he never get in any legal trouble like this guy is like he's messed up a great lawyer or a great team of lawyers money apparently it's just money, money. He had, yeah he had like said his dad had started like a super successful business a huge law firm yeah law huge firm. law firm still receiving like I don't know if it was like his dad shares, but he was still receiving like millions every year. So it wasn't just like on like top of the inheritance that he yeah. Had. So he was just constantly like he had like an endless amount of money. It was like a bottom. His bank account was just a bottomless pit. It he just kept going. He literally was was uh, peddling child porn. Basically, and, and he's yeah. free today. Like he's just chilling. No, he's dead. Remember. Or he, oh yeah, he died. <laughs> so John, oh, I God, remember John God. texted me when we were watching this. He's like, "How's this guy not in prison?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, he died." <laughs> oh <laughs> so yeah, he died. Yeah. If you, died. yeah, why. if you, um, because I I only found out that he died by like looking up the guy online. 
he died like a year. Let me see. Um, what? So this came out in twenty. This movie per, and and so there's a follow up to this. That John, did you end up watching the follow up on YouTube? The Tickle King. I didn't end up watching it actually. Oh, I, you I didn't. Mean, so. There's a 20 minute follow up video that they produced called The Tickle King that you can just watch on YouTube. Um, and basically, it follows the premiere of the documentary at Sundance. So, the documentary pr- premiered in 2016 at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, at the premiere, D'Amato showed up. David D'Amato came to the Sundance premiere. And at the time, uh, David Ferrier was promoting the film in New York. So they they had a premiere of the film in New York at the same time this premiere in Sundance. And Dylan, who worked on the film with David, um, was at the Sundance premiere. Now, in the when you watch the documentary later on, they end up tracking David D'Amato down, the sick dude who runs the whole show. They end up finding him. They they like stalk out in a parking lot away from his apartment complex for days, waiting for him to leave because they know what his car looks like. And then they follow him to a coffee shop, and they don't accost him or anything. But David like walks up to him, is just like, "Hey, like I'm worried." Like he doesn't really matter of fact. He's just like, "Hey, I'm worried about my safety with all these." you know, lawsuits you're throwing at me, like all this stuff. Like, can we talk about this? Um, so because of that, David D'Amato knows who David Ferrier is. They met, he's seen him, he's talked to him, he knows who he is. So at the Sundance premiere, David D'Amato, like basically interrupts the premiere and is like, where's your buddy David to Dylan? He's like, I want to see David. He was too coward to come to the premiere. And Dylan's like, no, he's promoting the film in New York. You can talk to me. And David D'Amato sat and watched the entire film. He's got like popcorn and a pop, and they film this whole thing. They have cameras there. They film it and they put it on you. They put this little mini uh, follow up doc on YouTube. And Dylan at the end of the documentary is like, uh, like asking David D'Amato to come up in the Q and A. Like, hey, you want to talk about the audience? Is like, and everyone's like, this is just so weird that this documentary just watched about this guy and he's sitting here in the audience watching us with him. And um, the whole thing ends up spilling out into a confrontation um, later on. Uh, into the street afterwards and basically Dylan like he threatens Dylan like these guys get a lawyer um, but apparently after that they never heard from him again um, and he ended up dying a year later he died in March of 2017 at 55 years old um, he was very overweight so I think he just had health issues but so then it all just went away and that was it <laughs> that was the end of it <laughs> So apparently the only thing that that came out of it after that was D'Amato filed a defamation and slander lawsuit against his stepmom because his stepmom is like the the documentary ends with them talking on the phone to his stepmother. And she like says she doesn't say anything like nasty about him, but she's very blunt and honest and open about him. And he tried to sue her for what she said about him in the documentary. Instead of she, going after, she just sounded scared. Like she was just like, "Stay away from him." Yeah, well, she literally goes. Like, she goes, "Don't go near him. Stay yeah. away from him." That's my recommendation. Basically, like he's a fucking psychopath. Yeah, like just don't do it. It's not worth it. Yeah, this guy, like she's like, he has problems. Like you need to stay away from him. Um, and obviously, he runs a freaking international tickling ring. Well. And I would have been curious to see if he had not died, if all of that, you know, what they uncovered and they base they, they uncover. I mean, John and I are just kind of touching the surface. I mean, throughout the documentary, it's not that long of a documentary. What is it? It's a hour and uh, it's an hour and a half, just under an hour and a half. So even in that runtime, they uncover a lot. I mean, they they work the breadcrumb trail and follow the path all the way to them. And the stuff that they find, man, like the things that they find, like what he does to people. Um, it's amazing that, again, I think it's just money. He just got away from away with it so long because of money. Yeah, like the one guy who had like all the letters that he was sending when he was pretending to be that woman, and he would send them to his mom, and like he's like, I've never even opened this one. Here, open it. Like, yeah. So it- yeah, they find out that before David D'Amato, like in the present tense of the documentary, before he got to be Jane O'Brien Media. That like in the '90s and early 2000s, he was this online alias, alias called Terry DeSoto or Terry Tickle, and Terry Tickle or Terry <laughs> DeSoto through the internet, he had never met this guy in person, had a manager, and that's what John was just talking about. Is the manager ends up getting threatened? Um, these dude messed up letters, 
the letters, like the manager basically tries to drop, he doesn't know that it's David D'Amato, he thinks it's a woman named Terry, tries to drop her um, because it's just so weird and, and, and like some, you know, they detail some of the stuff that happens. Um, but then when he tries to end the relationship, Terry DeSoto, Terry Tickle, or David D'Amato starts sending letters to like him, his mom, like his friends, like everyone he knows about him, like these nasty, nasty letters, like uh, making fun of him for his brother dying or something like oh, these yeah. just like super despicable, awful things. And you're just like, your mouth is open the whole time. You're like, what the hell? <laughs> the dude was very, very tortured, demented. Well, they said he might have been bipolar. Isn't isn't that what they said in the documentary? That yeah, he was but... like he was receiving like medical um uh like medical treatment for a long time for like bipolar disorder. And they said he that was part of the thing is super manipulative. Yes. He he wasn't freaking out on these people when they were doing what he wanted. It was when people finally said, Hey, enough's enough, like I'm good. Then he would go fucking all out and try to ruin their fucking lives. Yeah, he completely he tried to completely ruin their lives. <laughs> like, yes, exactly. So I maybe he was bipolar, but he had enough control to when people were doing what he wanted, he wasn't trying to ruin their lives. Oh, so, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know, man. It's and like I know you you mentioned before we started talking that you wouldn't watch this one again. I probably the only thing that would get me to watch this documentary again is this if I was showing it to someone for the first time, I would just be interested to see like people's reactions, like watching it with someone. Um, but I probably wouldn't go out of my way to watch this one like on my own again, like I would hands on a hard body. Um, oh. And I enjoyed it in terms of the entertainment value and just kind of like that true. It has a true crime element to it. Like this, this journalist is following these breadcrumbs of this, you know, this messed up organization. And this, it leads to this character study basically of this very tortured, you know, kind of deplorable individual. Um, and that part of it's, you know, fascinating and, and kind of reading up on it. But outside of that, yeah, I don't know how much I would watch this one again. I don't know if you had any other thoughts on it. Um, otherwise that's about all I had to say on this one, but it's yeah. present it's presentation. It's really well presented. Um, I thought they did a good job with how they present the, the stuff that they find, the information, how they do the research. Um, there's some good music in it. Um, but other than that, the documentary is not like structured, uh, or like edited any special way. It's just kind of the journey of this character study of this messed up real life individual. I mean, that's about the, the, the draw to it. That sums it up. Sounds like it's time for, uh, (laughs) well, all right, man, if you don't have anything else to add on that one, then we'll, uh, we're getting moving along pretty quickly here. We'll, uh, we'll end with one more documentary. So if you haven't seen tickled and you're interested to watch it, you can watch it on Hulu. Tickled is streaming, uh, with a subscription on Hulu. And I think you could, you could probably rent it. Uh, there's a few VOD services I think you can rent it through. But if you got Hulu, you can check out Tickled. Uh, the last documentary that we're going to talk about here is brand new. This one came out last year. It's a 2020 documentary film. This one is an American documentary um, about Pepe the Frog. <laughs> so anyone who has had any sort of internet presence um, ever uh I'm assuming you have to be familiar at this point. Anyone who has any internet presence, even has, if you don't know the name, you've seen the image of Pepe the Frog. It. You've seen it. It's like ubiquitous with internet memes. Like it is the Uh-oh. most famous internet meme of all time. Like he has like five cards, and what do you mean? Maybe ten. I don't know. It's a lot. The game. What do you mean? Have you ever yeah. played? Yeah, I have not played it, but I know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, he has like. Oh wait, yeah, yeah. I think I've played it once. A bunch I, of I've, Pepe yeah. has like a bunch in that, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is this this meme, Pepe the Frog. So, so I'll, I'll introduce the film a little bit first. So, it's called Feels Good Man, um, because the documentary follows the creator of Pepe the Frog. Um, so most pe- I wasn't even aware of this. So Pepe the Frog actually um, was a car- was a cartoon character was a was an internet comic character created by an artist named Matt Fury. Um, he created Pepe the Frog like in the early 2000s and they even said in the documentary he had been drawing the images of Pepe on his own, you know, when he was much younger. Um, he had been doing it for years and then he got 
popular on MySpace. So like back in the early 2000s when MySpace was huge, Matt Fury was posting an internet comic called Boys Club. And his comic Boys Club was about 420-something post-college slacker friends who lived together, and they were all like animal characters. And one of them was Pepe, and he was a frog. And there was this one comic that he created, this one version or story um, (laughs) where Pepe is going pee and his buddy walks in on him in the bathroom peeing and Pepe's peeing with his pants all the way down to the floor around his ankles. And so the the comic is very crude, obviously being post-college kind of slacker. You know, it's got a lot of crude bathroom humor, stupid humor, college humor. Um, And so Pepe tells his, his friends like in the comic, like, why are you peeing like that? And he goes, feels good man um and so that image in the comic the 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 strip of the comic where he says feels good man is the image of pepe the frog that became a viral meme thus the name of the documentary and so the documentary kind of takes you through the history of you know there's two things going on at once so the documentary kind of takes you through matt fury's life and then they, they, they intercut it and juxtapose Matt Fury's life with the evolution of his character that he created. And so everything that was happening in Matt's life and what's going on in his life while this character that he put on the internet spirals out of control and takes an entirely different meaning and complete life of its own outside of anything Matt Fury could have ever imagined. So again, like John, I mentioned, you're a, it, anyone who's been on the internet, even if even if you've never been on the internet, I bet if I showed you, if you Googled Pepe the Frog, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. I maybe didn't know that was what his name was, but I've seen that image. Um, and it's not just one image. It's like him. It's like Pepe doing endless. a million different things. Endless. Like you, endless. You've seen one. You've seen one. You've even seen, you there's them. millions of variations. Yeah. I mean, even if you haven't seen the original one, the, the, the variations are endless. Absolutely That's endless. part of the dark turn of the whole documentary. So, yeah. So <laughs> what makes this documentary so fascinating is if anyone, you know, listening right now, if you've kind of followed internet memes and internet culture over the years, the alt-right uh, back in 2015, 2016, basically stole Pepe the Frog um, and turned him into a symbol for hate. Basically, when Donald Trump was running, I mean, that, I did not imagine that this documentary was going to get into, like, be so heavily into politics and Donald Trump. I knew, I knew that Pepe the Frog had been stolen by by the alt right. I was aware of that, and I knew that he had been used for a lot of hateful things on the internet. But I didn't realize the extent of it. I mean, it's crazy. It gets into, you know, subreddits and 4chan, and basically how those blogger and message boards on the internet are where meme culture like was born and how Pepe like basically it's like a hell that Pepe was trapped in and then just took all these variations there and all of these like basement dwellers living with their mom who make their lives on 4chan and Reddit basically were like trying to meme Donald Trump into the White House and they basically used Pepe in a Donald Trump meme and I've seen that one. I don't know if you have. I had seen that one where Donald Trump is Pepe the Frog. And so that was kind of where it all started and spiraled from there. Um, Donald Trump even uh, even retweeted it. Yes, that like, was where it blew up. He yeah, retweeted an image exactly. of himself as Pepe the Frog. Then, and I didn't realize they, they show these clips of all these alt-right leaders talking about Pepe the Frog. Like bringing him up in conversation, like recorded video interviews. I didn't realize realize like freaking what's his name alex jones that absolute moron um basically there was a whole controversy with him and pepe the frog between him and matt fury yeah matt fury won a lawsuit um uh, yeah so that's what the documentary ends up showing you is that he starts suing all these people to claim his character back yeah but they basically tell him like by the there's like long story short he, he gets just absolutely pepe the frog the people like the 4chan subredditors, they get pissed that Matt's trying to take him back. Yeah. So they go even harder. Mm-hmm. Like, and they're just like an endless amount of people, like Vince said, just chilling in their basement. This is trolls. what we do. This just is like, that's their life. And they felt like Pepe was theirs in the beginning. And then they were getting upset because all of these normies <laughs> were 
that's what they call them. I like, know, I know. We're like just... stealing him and posting it and like, oh, I love Pee Pee the Frog. And they're yeah, just that like, one girl Pee-pee. calling him Pee Pee. Oh, that was killing me. But, I know, it was killing me too. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I mispronounce things all the time, but she just kept, it's like, you got to see it. She says it like a hundred times. She and, keeps saying Pee Pee, Pee Pee the Frog. Yeah, I'm like, dude. Yeah. And then they just get more and more upset and they genuinely like, and then Donald Trump getting elected, they felt like they played a huge part in Donald Trump getting elected. That, that aspect of this documentary, I had no idea. I didn't yeah. realize that there was this huge online. I, I was aware of the online culture I'm saying, but like, I wasn't aware that this online culture, like meme culture and troll culture on 4chan and, and and Reddit and, you know, all those message boards, like that they felt like they had controlled the election through meme culture. That aspect I was not aware of. Oh, and celebrated it. And oh. they saw Donald Trump as Donald Trump was like they were. He was an outsider. He was someone who did not belong where yep. he was trying to go. And then once he got there, they absolutely celebrated it. Like, oh, yeah. Like they were like, this is our victory. Like, holy like shit we got donald trump in the white house like we can do yeah. anything like i didn't know any of that stuff <laughs> it, dude it's it's wild and it's I, all in poor matt because like it's like this like innocent like type like like ben said like a little, a little bit of like crude college humor not a big well deal. and even he is just this very unassuming like they just some of his friends describe him early on like he just looks like this like cool dude he doesn't even look like an artist if you see this guy you'd never imagine he was like this big time artist um, because he just has this cool dude kind of laid back vibe, kind of like some of his characters, but then this poor man, like that he created this unassuming, simple character as a, you know, as a young person. And then as a, excuse me, as a young adult was like, just trying to make his comic, his internet comic. And it just turned into this, one of the most famous internet things of all time. Yeah, I mean, one of the some of the saddest parts were like when him and his um, I think they refer to her as like his partner. Yeah, they're not like, like officially married. I don't they think. have like a garage full of uh, Pepe like yeah. merchandise that yeah. they can't sell yeah. because yeah. they're like one. We don't want to give it like we don't want to sell it because we don't want like alt right alt right people to buy it to, to buy it and to be like yeah yeah and then like they don't want to just like give it away but they'd spend like tens of thousands of dollars on like all this stuff and it's just like yeah you can't do anything with it you can't do anything with it and he's just and people started associating him with the the alt rights and they, they thought he was a white nationalist and he's absolutely not he's just this average dude <laughs> artist so it should have been called poor matt like <laughs> they ruined his life like he created like this alt right symbol so everyone's like oh like yeah he's a part of it and He's just absolutely not. And then other people, like he, he's, he like mentioned, like bringing it up to people, or like his friends would try to defend him, and people would just be like, "Oh, yeah, the guy who like, you, so it's like you're trying to defend the guy who created this alt right symbol." And it's just like, it's not what it is. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, like just, that one. Yeah, his one friend, the the woman who's his friend, is like, "Yeah, I'd explain to someone that my friend created this, but like, it was that he, show. It was like Samantha B show. It's on TBS. Yeah, and yeah, she was yeah. like, he created this like." years ago like and it does not mean that at all and he yeah. said and she was like she just looked at her and was like oh yeah all right yeah sure sure like yeah that, like and the woman didn't believe her like oh yeah and yeah. she's like oh my god but like at that point it's understandable to a to a degree just because it had been literally overtaken by yeah. the right. and the harder he pushed legally the harder the people they fought back they fought back dude and they just put out more content more like racist content more nazi affiliated white nationalist type content like and they just and, and the, the one lawyer was just like uh from that one group he was like dude you just have to let it you have to accept that it's not yours anymore like you just have to accept it. well where he started winning so and that's the, the documentary by the end gets into some of the legal battles he starts winning are when people start trying to sell the image because Matt was actually smart. One of the smartest things he ever did was he did have a copyright on it. He did have the character copyrighted in 2007, like a long time ago, and he had legal documentation of it being copyrighted, of him owning the owning the copyright. So when people like Alex Jones started selling a poster with Pepe the Frog on it and all these other like alt-right leaders and like major conservative leaders, and making money off of it, 
Matt won that legal battle. And then there was all these other websites that were trying to sell. This guy was trying to sell an alt-right child's children's book with Pepe the Frog as a lit main character. And he won that legal battle because, again, yeah. he had – anytime someone started to try and profit off the likeness, he won. But only profit off the likeness. So they couldn't – he couldn't do anything about the millions the of memes. memes that are out yeah. there. Like, and so people, that, what so people think – will like never go away is basically what they were telling him. Like, it's great that you're winning these legal battles, but these people that aren't profiting off it and are just creating this, these meme, like these memes and pushing them out there. You can't do anything about that. No, that's, and that's one of my favorite things. There's a couple things I really see you. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about hands on hard by that you might not rewatch this one. I loved this documentary and I would definitely rewatch it. And that, um, right now on my 2020, best of the year list i have this at like four or five this is like one of my favorite films yeah um because i loved like its commentary on internet culture i think it does a couple things that are really fascinating um and 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 again it's like juxtaposed it's side by side the movie details this internet culture through one of the most iconic images ever on the internet while at the same time it's a character study of the guy the unassuming man who created it so it's like these two fascinating stories that get blended together because they're really one and the same right this guy's character that he just lost control over um, but at the same time it completely kind of took his life away from him there was like you were saying like the 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 money side of it like with all he him and his his partner were trying to open up a merchandise store before this happened and it was like right around the time that it, he lost control of it in terms of the negative aspect of it um in terms of people thinking he was like a, a an alt right nationalist white supremacist whatever like and he's just this not he's like the opposite of that so he was like trying to get not only get his character back but get his life back in order through the character yeah. like um and then the film also is broken up into these gorgeous, gorgeous animations. And I watched the credits. I was wondering if Matt had any involvement, but he's not. He's not involved with any of the uh, the animation in the documentary. But there's these beautiful um, animation sequences, animated sequences throughout the film um, with Pepe the Frog that the the filmmakers created. And, and um, in addition, there's an original score that's super unique and weird. Uh, that feels very internet like, you know, very like uh, kind of pop dance music. And uh, it's got like a, it gets kind of some dark elements to it when the more sinister stuff happens with Pepe later on. Um, but just like as not even a documentary, but as an overall film, I just think it's really fascinating and it's very well made. It actually just like tickled, it premiered at Sundance uh, last year and uh, it won, it won a special jury award for documentary filmmaking. So. Um, I don't think this one's getting any Oscar buzz, unfortunately, because it's such a small movie. Uh, the director, Arthur Jones, um, this was his first film, which I thought was very interesting. Um, I haven't had a ch- chance to check his IMDb, but he does not even have a Wikipedia page. Uh, this is his directorial debut. Um, and I thought he did a great job. I mean, they did a really great job with this documentary. And I don't think it's everyone. It probably won't be everyone's cup of tea because if you're not into, you know, internet culture especially something this specific although like i mentioned this is kind of like ubiquitous with the internet pepe the frog is like everywhere like you can't go on the internet and explore the internet to any anything past the surface level and not know what pepe the frog is like he's just everywhere um so but i i'm very much you know i've been a you know been on the internet uh since i was probably you know 11 or 12 years old using aol instant messaging um, so I, I thought that it was fascinating watching some of the old, they have some images and some scenes where they like, they show old YouTube dude. I remember back in middle school, old YouTube, um, like the old user interface, the setup, um, you know what it used to look like. They show some of the old images on YouTube and videos. I thought that was fascinating getting into my space. You know, I used MySpace back in the day. Um, so I thought that was fascinating kind of seeing some of that internet history and internet culture, um, brought to life in the in the documentary but um i i would get like if you can't stand the political turn the film takes but it's unavoidable because that's that's what happens to this this character that he created it takes this political turn unintentionally um this group of people kind of just steal the character and turns it into this sinister hate i mean the the character ends up getting the the last thing matt is fighting um in the end of the film 
is what's the organization? It's there's this organization. Was it in New York? They're like a, an organization labeled, that, labeled as like a hate symbol. Yeah, like they have like an official database for hate words, hate speech, hate symbols, and Pepe the Frog got added. And so like Matt's like final like victory that he was working towards, and I don't, I think he failed. I don't know if you know in the last year since this premiered. Um, if anything has happened, I'd have to go look. But at the time when this came out, just over a year ago, um, he lost. They they basically told him, you know, as of right now, we we can't remove it from our hate symbols because the alt right is such a strong hold on it. And that's what I was referring to. I was assuming that he was a lawyer for that um, corporation or whatever they are. And yeah, I can't remember what the organization like, was called. He's just like, you just got to give it up because like, it's not yours anymore. Like, yeah. it's not, it's, you just have to accept you, it. Like, like you may like, have a copyright for the image, but in terms of the life it's taken on, on the internet, I mean, it's the internet, man. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Like, you just no. got to let it go. You, like, you, yeah. <laughs> Which is so sad. I feel like Matt just looks like this, the nicest guy ever. And you just feel so bad for this guy. Because yeah. he didn't do anything wrong. And Matt Matt even talks about plenty of times in the documentary. He goes, I'm not, like, political. Like, he goes, I don't like these people, but I'm not someone who, like, spends my time. He goes, I, I'm an artist, you know? I make art. And I make, like, you know, quirky, you know, silly art. So it's like he's not even, like, some political artist. You know, he's not doing, like, political cartoons. So you just feel so bad for this guy because he just seems like he's a, he's got a not a wife. I think again, I think they label themselves partners, but they have two kids together. He's got a family, you know, and he's he's a dad. Um, so you just feel for this guy. I don't know, but I I loved it, man. I really like this documentary a lot. Um, one of the reasons I want to talk about it is because not a lot of people are talking about it. Um, I don't think it ever got an official theatrical release. As of early February 2020, the film was seeking distribution. We, I, I don't know how John watched it. I rented it on Amazon Prime. Um, it was two ninety nine on Amazon Prime. I think that's also how I watched it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, if anything, the last thing I would say is just it, it's good for it to be out there just to help to clear Matt's name just because of that association. Yeah um, with alt-right movement, white nationalist movement, white supremacy movement. It's just oh, like... Yeah. It's just not him at all. So no. people that just are like, oh, he that's the creator? What a douchebag. Like, he's just a racist asshole. <laughs> like, that's no. not who he is. Like, so if anything, just getting the documentary out there and clearing this dude's name, because the symbol's going to be what it is. Yes. You know, but clearing the guy's name at least is, is going to be beneficial, I believe. Yeah. And I, the other thing we didn't mention yet was one thing Matt and a lot of his friends and people kind of championed. Um, was a Save Pepe campaign. There was this hashtag Save Pepe and Matt um, and a bunch of his friends and, and, and fellow artists and colleagues, um, and they interview a bunch of the people who got involved in it, basically tried coming up with positive memes, positive images of Pepe, um, and started the hashtag Save Pepe campaign, had all these people share these new memes, new positive images of him. And even the alt-right took that over and turned all of them, a lot of them into more racist, negative, nasty imagery and memes. Um, and then Matt killed him. Matt created a new boys club comic and killed Pepe off. I love that. I thought it was great, too. He I had this beautiful great. funeral with all of his friends. Um, it was very well done. You know, it wasn't like... It wasn't harsh or aggressive or anything. It was just a very, you know, kind of somber, sad comic strip of his boys club. Um, there was even some humorous elements to it. And he put that out on the Internet. Um, and uh, hey, oh, and then the all right, they started posting messages. They're like, they're like, we won, like because he killed them. He's like, yeah. that is officially ours now. <laughs> like they, that's how they that's how that's they were. The inter- yeah. That's the Internet. Like. <laughs> you're just you're not gonna win with all these people these people who like dude they literally spend their i mean they dude that one guy who was like a four they call him a they interviewed a few people who call themselves four channers or like like i don't know if that's supposed to be their freaking job like horrible disgusting dirty oh my room. gosh yeah the guy who mom, like mom basement yeah, this guy they interview basically is like a huge – he's been like on 4chan for like a decade and has been there for the entire journey of Pepe. And this guy is like 
I don't know if he was outright an alt-right supporter, but he might as well have been because he kind of championed a lot of the nasty stuff that Pepe the meme took on. And uh, he kind of gave, you know, a kind of flip side of the coin perspective, you know, from, from this, from the side of all of these four channers and all these, these people, like he gave their viewpoint of it. And you can kind of empathize with the guy because there, there's this whole generation of people addicted to the internet, you know, people, John and I are millennials, you know, so millennial, this guy was a millennial, you know, people have been on the internet for 15, 16, 17, 18 years. And then, you know, you now you got a new generation of generation Z addicted to the internet and kind of these people who get lost, you know, they're, they've, they've lost their way in life because they're living through the internet. They're, they're not, they're not, they're disassociated from reality. And so you kind of empathize with them to a, to an extent, like, that this guy just has this, these people have this sick addiction to the internet and they've completely lost their way through this internet culture. They've just been sucked into it and it's just this negative cesspool. I mean, I mean, some of the stuff they show you, I mean, the documentary is rated R because they actually do show you, um, in, in addition to some of the interviewers having, you know, strong language, but they show you, you know, unedited, uncensored, some of these horrible, horrible memes and messages on the on the 4chan message boards, and it's like, yeah, that's that's the internet. There's these horrible people that get to hide behind a screen and they say whatever they want, and and so like you can only empathize with this guy to a, to an extent because at the end of the day, he's from that community and a part of that community and champions that community of these people who are like just the worst. <laughs> Yeah, you feel bad for a second because they're talking and a lot of these guys are like the people who would be considered like incels um and he they're just like he's like you know we're just like a bunch of like lonely loser outcasts like you can kind of empathize with like the isolation and not fitting in and probably being bullied and things of that nature and then there's things like um when they were trying to make hillary clinton collapse like that was the oh goal God, to make her crazy. collapse so they just kept putting out content, like just really negative derogatory comments towards her. And then she ended up collapsing, collapsing. and they attributed it to their, their campaign to like, just bombard yeah. her with negative, like memes and, and things of that nature. Like, it's kind of crazy. And they like celebrated it. Like, yes. Like the, the documentary is in that way, a testament to the power of the internet too, whether, you know. And I saw someone, I saw someone, I don't remember if it was in the documentary or something I was looking at online after the fact, but someone was like, could you imagine if these people did this for something positive, like put this power to get, like came together and championed or like worked towards some positive goal, some positive end. They can have a lot of power. I mean, it's yeah. Like the, the, the scene in the documentary, which apparently was a real thing. Um, some guy who was a part of the 4chan board went to a Hillary Clinton like rally or speech and like yelled Pepe. He screamed Pepe, and you you can see the 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 video of Hillary during her speech. You can hear the guy scream Pepe, and then they show the internet boards go nuts that this guy like basically was championing Pepe as an alt right symbol. So he yelled it at this liberal Democrat event. And so, like, they saw that as a victory, and then it just spiraled, even got worse from there. I don't know if Hillary Clinton's a liberal, but it was definitely a Democrat. Democrat, <laughs> yeah, Democrat, you know, a Democrat event. So they saw it as, like, a victory, you know, we're yelling this character's name that we see as an alt-right, you know, movement, and it's at this Democratic event. So it's, like, a big win for us. I thought that was another moment that I'm like, what the? Like, yeah, these people are nuts. Freaking crazy. But I guess again, if if you can empathize with them for a moment, as horrible as those people are, you can see like they've just that's their life. Like they're just sucked into this this internet culture. They're so far gone. Like that guy in his mom's basement. Um like obviously the mom didn't want to be in the documentary, her face was blurred out. Only that guy's face was, you know, visible everyone else in the house their faces were blurred out so i'd be curious to know how the documentarians how the filmmakers got found this guy um but it didn't seem like the people there you know it didn't seem like a very great household to be a part of and this guy's just living in his mom's basement in the most disgusting living situation possible i mean but 
I think they were just trying to show you these are the types of people. This is like maybe an average person you'd probably find living like this on 4chan. I hope that's not an example of that. <laughs> it was. I mean, of, you can you can you can make like, the argument that that's not the the average person on 4chan, but let's hope not. It was like he had never heard of a trash can and everything he had ever eaten the scraps of and the waste from it. He just threw on the floor. You know like, what it reminded me of? You like South Park, don't you? I love South Park. It made me think of the World of Warcraft episode. The guy. Oh, like those, <laughs> like, mom. <laughs> yeah. No, not not uh, Cartman, but the guy, the the dude in oh, California. Dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's killing like, everybody? He has like he's uh, like breathing heavy. He's got the wrist yeah, guard, yeah. and his apartment's trashed. Yeah, it made me think of that guy. Yeah. No, for sure. But then, like Cartman and the and the other boys, like turn into that. They as, turn into that. Cartman too, can't yeah. even stand up. Like his mom brings him like a shit bucket and stuff. <laughs> like, but that that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Like that's that's a great that's that episode of South Park is a great example of like satire of the internet but like this documentary like shows that stuff for real like these people and this and culture honestly, for real this, this kid was it was worse than that guy in south park i feel like oh absolutely it's, the base it was it's bad it's yeah you really got you just got to watch the documentary to see what we're talking about i mean <laughs> they bad. go to this dude's house who's this big fortune guy and they go into the, his living situation it's like it makes you gag like just what i'm like dude and he's like proud of it He's like kicking stuff around, like bragging to the camera. Like well, bragging, he also kind of said that he was like trash. He's like, I'm going trash. Like, yeah, he's like, I mean? but like, he's like cool with it. Like, this is my life. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, he's embraced it. Ah, yeah. uh, man, I don't. It's a it's a really good documentary, and it, it, it there's a lot of conversation pieces that you could get into in terms of the not only the specifics in the film, but kind of the internet culture that they kind of touch on throughout it, but. Um, I just think that's what makes this film so rewatchable is a couple things, you know, the, the beautiful animated sequences, the music's really good. Um, Matt Fury is kind of a character study, this internet culture, the story of Pepe, the frog, um, how it takes this political turn. I just think that this film has so many different things going on for it. Um, and the fact that they do it in under 90 minutes, like all of this stuff is touched on and explored, um, and I know you could, they could have probably gone even deeper with some of the things that they just kind of just barely touch on. Um, sure. but I think the structure of it and the focus of it is, is, is they keep it on track and on pace well enough throughout that it, it, it feels cohesive and it feels like a start to finish story. Um, that's something that, you know, doesn't lose itself along the way, you know, it doesn't like get caught up in too much. Like it doesn't try and, you know, bite off more than it can chew. Um, it gives you just a taste of some things so that, you, you know, um, it's relevant to the, the main idea there and, you know, two stories simultaneously that they're basically trying to tell you throughout. But I, I really enjoyed this one, man. I, I think more people got to check it out. Like I said, um, it doesn't seem like as of now it's had an official theatrical release. It's, it's a, premiered at some festivals, um, including Sundance where it won an award last year, um, it's available if you want to check it out. Anyone listening, it's available on VOD. I rented it on Amazon Prime. It was like $2.99. Um, I don't know if it will get a theatrical release. Um, I I would have to go on IMDb, but I didn't see what its budget was. I mean, the animation sequences are incredible. So I would want to be curious, you know, you know what that cost them doing some of those. But it's really well done. Um, I really liked it. Definitely got to check it out. Um, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add about it, John, but uh, I enjoyed it, man. I hope I hope you liked it. No, I really did like it. I actually thought of the three. I thought it was the I thought it was the best documentary of the three. In terms of the overall like exactly. filmmaking qualities. Exactly. I just don't want to watch it again because I, oh, yeah. I feel so bad for, for Matt. Matt. It just makes me feel terrible. Like to imagine being in that situation where the world is labeling you as something that you absolutely are not. Yeah. You, know, you can't do anything about it. Like that's just like ugh. It's like gaslighting on an international level. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> like convincing cool. him he's this horrible person and and yeah. these people because and that's like that's that's another th i mean you could keep talking about this i could keep talking about this documentary it, it in that regard it kind of explores the reactionary um aspect of the internet you know the witch hunt mob mentality the you know facts don't care about your feelings kind of stuff and the uh you know, the Facebook warriors, you know, you don't, you don't really do any of your research. You see a headline, you see an image and it tells you everything you need to know. You don't need to do any research. And so Matt is kind of at the, 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 the receiving end of that, of all of that, 
You know what I mean? Because you got all these people around the world who now associate him with this image. And they don't – that's why this documentary, like you said, I'm hoping that's what comes out of this is people watch this, um, whether you know about Matt Fury or not – but everyone knows about the Pepe character, at least I would imagine if you have any sort of internet pre- pre- uh, pre- presence that you do, that at least this will clear up some things in terms of the history of it. Because that's another thing that's so weird about the internet, man, is something like this. Like, I didn't know about the history of this character because the internet is so vast and has so many layers. There's so many, like, dark corners and dark places. So, like, a char- it's fascinating to watch this documentary explore how this innocent character gets chewed up and spit out in these vast corners of the internet to the point where no one even knows where this character came from. Most of these people they interviewed, like the 4chaners, they didn't know who Matt Fury was. They had no idea where this character ever came from because it it gets chewed up and spit out and and redone so many times that people just don't know anymore. They have no idea. So, again, it's just I think it's fascinating to kind of explore that aspect of the internet and internet culture. It's just, it's... A lot of good on the internet and a lot of bad. Sometimes I think more bad than good <laughs> comes out of the internet. This kind of this documentary shows some of that. But uh, anyway, any other thoughts you want to add? Otherwise, we can uh, kind of wrap things up here. We're pushing just over about an hour now, so not too bad. No, no, that was my that was my final thought on it. I already gave it. So, <laughs> what was your fate? So, what was your favorite? You thought this one was the best made documentary, and I would agree with you on that one. Would you say Hands in a Hard Body was your favorite of the three? Yeah. In terms of re- like rewatchability? Yeah, I would say it's my favorite of the three. I just it just gave me some good laughs and it just it was it was uh I don't know. It was just unexpected a little bit, you know? It's like a sl- that movie's like a slice of Americana too. It like it feels so American. <laughs> Like in a weird way in America. <laughs> exactly <laughs> like something like that documentary could not come from anywhere else in the world and so specifically texas yeah like it just feels like southern united I feel states like it could happen in like florida too so like, yeah southern united states alabama yeah. florida georgia yeah, just, it just so, feels yeah. so american and i think that's what makes that one also so interesting too <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, definitely yeah that was my favorite one but i think the best one was feels good man well all right man uh we'll we'll kind of wrap things up here then thank you john for joining me tonight before we wrap things up uh anything you would like to plug um just plug blueprint athletes real quick so um i have a podcast as well so blueprint athletes podcast um it's available it's on youtube it's on you pretty much anywhere where you can get a podcast. And uh, we basically just talk about um, training, basketball, the mental approach to things, setting goals, realis- unrealistic expectations, um, you know, a bunch of topics. It's really applicable to life in general, more so than just basketball, but it's through a basketball lens. Um, and then Blueprint Athletes is uh, an app that I developed um, well, I'm not actually the developer, but I created the app, the concept, the content. Um, and it, it just, it's, I call it a habit development app just because it basically just provides players or coaches or parents or whoever um, with workouts in a structured manner. And with the new app, you're able to like create teams and create your own customized plans. So even if you don't love the way that I've organized some of the guides, each guide's a month long. I think we have like 60 right now. We're adding new ones every week. Um, you can pick and choose what workouts you want, order them up the way that you want and send plans to people. So you can have a structured plan based on your, your individual skill level or whatever you want to improve on or whatever your coach thinks you need to improve on. And we have strength conditioning. We have at home strength conditioning. We have a ton of basketball content. We have conditioning content. We have mental focus content. Um, so I, I just think that it's a really excellent resource for players that want to develop. I mean, and even people who have trainers, Like even if you're seeing your trainer three times a week, one to two days a week with the app, with a structured workout, with a plan, you just have that much more time to get better and to develop and to, um, you know, really hone in on your skills and the habits that are going to make you a better person and, um, you know, a better athlete, you know, you have to persevere. There's time management. Um, 
you have to be patient because I mean, developing anything, getting stronger, all those things, they take time and you just have to kind of stay the course with it. And a lot of people, um, you know, end up quitting because they're like, ah, it's just not for me. When if they would have just stayed stuck with it a little bit longer, you know, sometimes, you know, things just end up working out and you just keep working. So, um, that's, uh, uh, that's about all. That's about takes, all it takes a month to develop a habit, they say. It, it, yeah, it just, it takes time and you just have to kind of find a way to fall in love with the process. I know you understand that as somebody who played, um, you know, college sports, it's just, it's, it's not that easy. Like there's a reason why such a small percentage of players go on to play college and not that like you can only use the app if that's your goal. Like, you know, if your goal is to make a team or just improve your skills so you can be competitive in open gym it's a great idea to, to start working on some of your skills in a more structured way. And then there are ways within the app to track your, your stats. So you can track your progress and your percentages. Um, we have like a, it's called ad log. It's an ad log feature. So you can track your, your weight, your sets and reps, your um, makes and misses. It gives you percentages for each drill. So you know, which drills you're best at. Um, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of cool stuff on the app. So. I would have loved having some. I mean, obviously it's basketball, and I, I played football, but something like that would have been great uh, in high school and or college in terms of keeping me structured, you know, outside of whatever you know we were doing for the you know in the off season things like. But definitely high school, I would have yeah. loved to have something like that in high school. And I I can attest to the podcast that John does as even if you're not doing anything basketball related, I like watching basketball, but I don't play currently play basketball. I'm a washed up athlete. Um, I enjoy listening to John's podcast. Uh, he's got some great life advice and, uh, interesting topics that him and his wife and his brother have discussed, uh, on there. So I'll, I'll be putting those links in the description on the YouTube video of this. And, uh, if you are listening, uh, to my podcast, uh, this episode that we're doing, you should be able to find the links in the uh, the episode description on uh, either Apple, Spotify, or Amazon, whichever one you're using. Um, well, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, appreciate having you on, taking time to uh, chat here, and uh, we'll be back very soon with another guest, another episode. Hope to have John on again sometime soon. Uh, until next time. I'm Vince with guest John Horford on the Film Nerd Podcast, and go watch some movies.